about symbols? Well, let me guess. All right.
Bibles to Genesis chapter 18, and we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 33. And we are continuing to look at the life of Abraham, and uh, last week we were talking about Abraham and uh, how God visited him in the form of uh, three men talked a little bit about how he, all kind of different opinions as to what, what all that was about, but um, there was a, a, re, uh, a re-giving uh, of the promise uh, that, God had, that God had given to Abraham really several times up to this point, and some specific information about uh, how <clears throat> a year from then, uh, Abraham and Sarah would, would have a child. Uh, but what we find out in this passage that we're going to read this evening is that there was there was another purpose for this for this visit by these three. Uh, it wasn't just to see Abraham and tell about uh, the coming birth of a son. There there was there was another more uh, a grim I guess purpose to it as well. And so we'll start to see a little bit of, of what that's going to be. Uh, this in this passage we'll get more into it next week but um, <clears throat> so this is after all the conversation with um, between God and Abraham about about this about the coming birth of his son and then this is starting in verse 16 then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom and Abraham was walking with them to send them off and the Lord said Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? For I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is, extreme, is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to his outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose forty are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the forty. And then he said, O oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak. Suppose thirty are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the twenty. And then he said, O oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. So, <clears throat> what we find is that uh, God is going to visit Sodom and Gomorrah to find out how evil they are. 
with the purpose of um, bringing, bringing judgment upon them. And so <clears throat> the, the main point that I, that I want us to take from this passage is, is one that I think is pretty, pretty pertinent for the, for the time that we're living in. It's the, the idea that God is faithful in justice. So justice, if you have not been living under a rock for the past mm -hmm. month or so, is like, the, I mean, that's the word in our, in our society these days. Um, <clears throat> and whatever justice may mean in any one particular situation, uh, what we find is that we as human beings can, can attempt to be just, we can attempt to bring justice to a, to a situation, uh, but what the Bible tells us, thankfully, is that we can look to God to be the ultimate in justice, that he, that he is just. He is the very definition of what justice means. And so, <clears throat> some, some uh, you know, of all of the attributes of God, of the things that we can describe God as, justice is, is one of the most important ones. And um, we still, we'll see that in this, in this passage. And, and there's re really th three things about God's faithfulness and justice that we're going we're gonna to look at. Number one, just the idea that God is just. Number two, uh, that because God is just, uh, we, can't, we can't stand in front of God's justice. We, we, can't, we, can't, uh, we can't hold up to that kind of uh, scrutiny. And so number two is that we need somebody to speak on our behalf. To this just God because we can't do it on our own and then the third thing is that even though God is just uh, he is also merciful and so there's God's mercy in view in this passage and so in verses 16 through 21 uh, God's justice is, is on display here Abraham is setting off uh, with these with these men that have visited him um, these men represent God's presence they're um, angels is what I think uh, well, I think two of them are angels. One of them, I think, is pre-incarnate Christ. But like I said last week, I'm not dead set on that. Somebody could prove me, get me to change my mind probably tomorrow. Uh, but I think that that makes the most sense to me. Either way, it's God's presence, whether it's angels or, or whatever. Um, and what we what, what's going on here as they're walking is that you've got it, sort of like internal dialogue within within God within the Godhead about whether to tell Abraham what's going to happen next. And so God's kind of like talking to himself, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? And basically the conclusion is, yes, I should. And the reasons are that Abraham is going to be the father of a mighty nation. Um, that Abraham, <clears throat> as the father of a mighty nation, that has already been promised to bring blessing upon all nations, um, then Abraham needs to know something about the fact that God is just and be able to teach that justice to his descendants. And so uh, God says in, um, in verse 20, the out, so verses uh, 17 through 19 is sort of like God talking to himself. And then in verse 20, that's when God tells Abraham, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly great. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to his outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. This is a weird thing for God to say about himself. Because um, it almost sounds like God doesn't know what's going on. Can y'all see where that would be? Like where it, it might could be taken that way. Uh, we just talked last week about the fact that God is omniscient. So God knows exactly what's going on in Sodom. He knows exactly what's going on in Gomorrah. Um, God sort of taking this form and going down and looking for himself uh, is really just to make it where Sodom and Gomorrah don't have any kind of excuse. They can't say, well, it was just hearsay. It was just, oh, you, you know, we, you know if, they, if they were to stand before God in a courtroom setting, they, they don't have any, they don't have a leg to stand on because God can say, hey, I went down there and saw it myself. And we'll see um, next week just how bad that's going to get. But um, there's no excuse here. <clears throat> and so what we find uh, is that God is just. Uh, he, he, he punishes sin. That, that's, 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 that's part of God's character. He, he cannot uh, leave sin unpunished. Uh, but God also does not punish when it's not deserved. And so, you know, again, there's this sort of idea of 
you know, if Sodom and Gomorrah are in a courtroom, they can't say, well, we, we didn't deserve this uh, because God has, has uh, verified it in person that, that what they were, you know, whatever evil it was, and like I said, the next chapter will give us the, the details of that. We won't get into that at this point. Um, but God doesn't punish when it's not deserved, and that sort of sounds like a good thing, except that we all deserve it. Like that, there's sort of a there's sort of a bad news setting up a bad news kind of deal for us, so that we can get to the good news later on. The bad news is we we deserve uh, punishment. That if that if God is truly just, that that should be a scary thing for us because uh, we don't measure up to His standard, and and God leaves us no excuse. There's there's no excuse for us to be, uh, you know, to stand before him and say, well, it's not my fault, or, you know, oh, I didn't, we didn't really do that. We are sinful. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's an important thing for us to remember, that, that we are sinners who are deserving of God's just punishment. Um, now, as Christians, and we'll get to how this passage speaks to it in, in a minute, as Christians, we know that, that that God's justice has been taken care of on the cross and that we can have forgiveness. Okay, so having received that forgiveness, um, how are we to, to respond to God's justice? Um, <clears throat> Abraham was promised that his people would be a blessing to others. And that's even, that's even uh, reiterated in, in this passage too. As Christians, we... we we fall under that category of sort of being Abraham's children in a different kind of way under a new covenant. So we ought to be a blessing to others as well. And so if God is just, if God treats people with justice, if, if, if nobody can stand before God and say, hey, you're treating me unfairly, uh, then people be, ought to be able to say the same thing about us, that we treat people justly, that we treat people fairly, that we don't take into account things like race or economics or you know, what position of power somebody has, that we treat everybody uh, fairly and with justice so that we can be a blessing to, to the people that we come in contact with just in the way we treat them. And hopefully that opens up opportunities for us to be able to share the gospel with people. And then also, if, if we know that God is just, uh, then we can rest knowing that, you know, sometimes if we are treated unjustly, uh, that eventually justice will be done, that God uh, will make all things right at some point, maybe not in this lifetime, uh, but we know that, that this lifetime isn't all there is, and so uh, we can trust God for justice even if we're being mistreated. Of course, nobody knows being mistreated more than, than Jesus did. Jesus was mistreated, and uh, so we, we can go to him and uh, He's sympathetic to us. He knows what that's like. So speaking of, of Jesus, uh, we find in the next several verses, in verses 22 through 26, that in light of God's justice, we can't stand. Certainly the, the people of Sodom, the people of Gomorrah, were not able to stand in front of God's justice. They were guilty. They were deserving of punishment. But really, we are all that way. We're all guilty and deserving of punishment. Uh, we need somebody to, to stand in and intercede for us, to, to, to be the go-between uh, between us and God. And so in, in this particular passage, what we find is that Abraham is doing that. And so I think this is part of that that, uh, that promise that God gives Abraham, that he's going to be a blessing to others. And so he's, he's stepping in and trying to be a blessing for the people of Sodom. And he get, begins to, to intercede for Sodom, and he... And he <clears throat> He appeals to God's justice. He says, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Shall not the judge of the earth do what is just? And what's implied there is no, God would, wouldn't do that. God would not sweep away the righteous with the wicked. He wouldn't uh, punish people for something they didn't do. And uh, so Abraham is taking on this role as intercessor. Now, Sodom was certainly not going to plead for themselves. You know, the people of Sodom weren't going to say, oh, yeah, we, never mind, we messed up, we're our bad. We're, you know, this, this isn't going to be a situation like, uh, say, Jonah. Remember Jonah? Jonah goes to Nineveh, and what happens to Nineveh? They actually do um, repent. There's not any repentance in Sodom. And even in the, even in the Nineveh story, Jonah's kind of the, the intercessor there. So there's, 
there's this pattern in scripture where people who are facing judgment need somebody to go in between and intercede for them. Uh, so Abraham is in kind of a unique position. He's this, this man that God has chosen to be the father of his people. And um, so in a way, God's got their, uh, Abraham's got this special relationship with God that sort of has him in both camps, kind of. Like he's got, he's got a connection to God, but then he's also got a connection to, to at least to Sodom. He's got, um, well, first of all, he's a human. And then number two, he's got his nephew Lot that lives there. So he's kind of got his foot in both camps. Um, he appeals to God's justice. He says, don't punish people, basically, who don't deserve it. And like I said, he's fulfilling that promise that he would be a blessing to others. Of course, we know the whole rest of the story that when we say Abraham's descendants are going to be a blessing to others, there's really that one descendant who we're talking about, and it's Jesus. And so when we think about Abraham sort of interceding for Sodom, and, or, well, for Sodom anyways, in this, in this passage, that ought to help us look ahead to Jesus, that Abraham is, is being sort of a, a pre, a, a pre, what's the word? Foreshadowing, I'm sorry, foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do. Jesus is the better intercessor because just like Sodom couldn't plead for themselves um, to God, we, we, can't, we can't plead for ourselves either. Like we can't stand before God and say, you know, we're, we're not guilty, you know, uh, we're innocent because we're guilty. We're sinners who uh, <clears throat> we've gone against God's uh, laws. We, we, we've gone against his character. We are sinful people that need an intercessor. And Jesus is the perfect intercessor. He's truly God. So he's, he's perfect. He's qualified to be our intercessor. Um, and but, but he's also man. Jesus comes uh, to this earth and, and lives uh life and, and as a human in every kind of way and so he's able to be our representative as well and you know th this story doesn't turn out good for Sodom uh, Abraham kind of talks down those numbers all the way down to 10 and it turns out there aren't 10 good people so the city's going to get destroyed um, but Jesus is an effective intercessor um, he steps in and is our substitute on the cross uh, and he takes the punishment that we deserve for our sin and uh, died for our sin, rose again, and is now uh, in heaven still interceding for us today. And so uh, Abraham in this passage is, again, a, a, a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do. So, you know, we need to trust in Jesus as our intercessor. And I think there's an example also that uh, not in the sense of we can't take anybody's sin for them or anything like that, but, but we can intercede for others. We can uh, appeal to God's justice on behalf of, of others who are suffering, and we can pray uh, for them just like Abraham did for the people of Sodom. Ultimately, as we read the rest of the story, you know, the writer of Genesis kind of lets us know why is it that Abraham cares so much about Sodom not getting destroyed. It's because his, cousin, his nephew, I keep saying cousin, his nephew is there, and he doesn't want his nephew to be, um, to be killed. But uh, what we find as this conversation continues between God and Abraham is that God is merciful. Um, God agrees he, with the first number. He says, 50 people in Sodom are righteous. Lord, will you not... Will you spare the city on behalf of these 50? Don't, don't wipe out 50 people that are good with all these other people who are bad. And um, God agrees. And then in verses 27 through 33, Abraham continues to lower that threshold. He goes from, he goes from uh, 50 to 45, uh, down to 40, then down to 30, then down to 20, and then down to 10. And uh, kind of a, an interesting thing to think about is that uh, you know a lot of times we like to compare ourselves to others, or we like to try to set up this this situation where well, if I'm good enough, maybe my good outweighs my bad, then then I can then I'm good, then I'm I'm okay. That God will have to accept me. That's that's if we were to go out there in the into the streets and just ask people how does how does one become right with God or how do you get to heaven or you know some kind of question like that, would y'all agree that? 
a lot of people would come up with some kind of system like that, that if you do more good than bad, then you're okay. <laughs> What's interesting in this passage is Abraham keeps lowering the, the standard. 50. Okay, we'll go with 50. Well, no, there's probably not 50. How about 40? And he keeps lowering the standard, and even with the standard at the lowest, Sodom can't, the city of Sodom can't measure up. And I think that's a reminder to us that it, it doesn't matter what we do to the standard. We can't even meet a low standard, much less God's perfect standard. And uh, we're, this whole, you know, this whole idea of God being justice, we like God's idea. We like the idea of God being just when it's like we want God to do something to them over there or these guys over here or, what you know, whoever. But when we apply God's justice to our lives, that's, it's, it, we're in sad shape. And what we need is God's mercy. And God shows his mercy in this passage, or at least his willingness to show mercy. He, um, like I said, Abraham bargains it down to 10. Uh, <clears throat> I, read the, I read one uh, commentary. It was like, well, kind of asked the question, well, why did, why did Abraham stop at 10? Why didn't, why didn't he just keep on getting it down to where um, he could be guaranteed, you know, Lot's safety? And I think, I think maybe the answer to that would be that God agreeing with, with every time he lowered the number, I think convinced Abraham of God's justice that it didn't matter what the number was going to be, God was going to rescue Lot, that Lot was going to be safe. Um, and we'll see that in the next chapter. Uh, because, you know, just to, to spoil things, and I've said this already anyways tonight, there aren't ten. There aren't ten righteous people in Sodom, and the city's going to be destroyed. Um, but God is mercy. God is willing to show mercy, um, at least theoretically, on the basis of 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, or 10, which then would give the rest of the city the, the ability to repent, the, the opportunity to repent. Um, but, of course, there isn't 10. And so, um, you know, it's, we need to remember that God's not obligated to show mercy on behalf of anyone. Um, but when we think about that statement, hopefully we can remember that he actually has. God has shown mercy on behalf of someone. And it wasn't, it wasn't Lot. It wasn't Abraham. It's, it's Jesus. God showed us mercy on behalf of one righteous man. Jesus was perfect and deserved no punishment. And Jesus essentially we want to mix in this story, became Sodom on the cross for us. He became all of the sin uh, that Sodom was guilty of. He became all of the sin that I'm guilty of, that you're guilty of. And he suffered God's wrath as Sodom will soon uh, find in the next chapter. And so I, I think it's just mind-boggling um, that, that the God who would show mercy to the city on behalf of ten uh, has, through Abraham's descendant, Jesus made mercy available to everybody who would, who would trust him. And so we need to remember that. We need to remember that uh, God has shown mercy in sending Jesus to be our substitute. The, the cross is the, is the place where God's justice and God's mercy exist at the same time. God is, is justly punishing our sin as, it's, as, as it was applied to Jesus, and he's showing us mercy um, at the same time. And so uh, we need to remember that we deserve God's justice. We deserve his just judgment uh, but that he's shown us mercy. And so we need to repent from, from the sin that's, uh, that's in our lives. We need to trust him, uh, put our faith in, in what he's done. Uh, we need to be thankful for what, for what Jesus did. We need to be thankful for, for God's mercy. Um, and, and certainly leaves us no room whatsoever for any kind of pride. Uh, if we live the Christian life proud, we, we don't understand the, the interaction between God's justice and mercy because uh, we have absolutely nothing to be proud about. And because of that, it ought to color the way in which we deal with others. Um, that when we're very quick to want God's mercy, not God's mercy, God's justice on somebody else, when we want God to strike somebody else down, when we want God to do, to do, you know, uh, to punish these people, um, remember that we've been shown mercy, and that we ought to show mercy uh, to others.
and hopefully uh, in these times that we live in where people need to be shown mercy and need to be shown grace uh, that we can be the ones that show that mercy and grace so that other people can um, ultimately know <coughs> why it is that we're showing mercy and grace to people uh, because we serve a God who is merciful and graceful and, but also just let's pray that we can do that Father I thank you for this day I thank you for uh, just everything about who you are that, that you reveal to us in your word your, your justice um, but also your mercy I thank you that you that you've provided a way for us to have uh, forgiveness for sins uh, so that we don't have to experience your, your just wrath uh, on, our, on our sin, uh, that you took care of that on the cross and that uh, that work is done and that we, we would repent and turn to you in faith that we can have, we can experience your mercy and we can look forward to, to the justice that, justice that you will one day bring. Uh, help us to, to treat people uh, the way we ought to help us to be people who are who are a blessing to others, who treat uh, others with with justice and mercy as well. We pray that you'll uh, give us the wisdom and the uh, the strength to be able to do that. We love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.